Well, good morning. We are beginning a uh, series of sermons into the book of Ephesians, and so this morning will be a little bit of the introduction to that. And I want to start with a personal story um, about a day that I was home from work because I was sick, and I was bored, and I was flipping through the television channels, and I came across a documentary on the local PBS station, uh, and it was a documentary about how public water fountains are designed and built, and that'll give you an idea, perhaps, of just how bored I really was. <laughs> but actually, it was, became uh, fairly interesting. They were talking about the kind of fountains that you, that you might see in a, in a fancy courtyard or in a mall or something like that, and at one point, they were talking about those streams of water that you see in fountains sometimes that are really perfectly clear streams that kind of go on a, on a straight path. And, uh, you know, when I think about water fountains, a lot of times I don't think about that. I think about a little bit of a turbulent, chaotic spray of water that's, that's all over the place and, and making all kinds of sounds and things like that. But they were talking about those streams where the, the sunlight glistens through the water and it travels in a perfect arch. And when it lands, it lands almost without a sound or a splash. And in order to make that happen, the first step, of course, is to remove all of the air from the water itself. But to get the full effect, what the designers do is put a series of filters and screens in the, in the water nozzle so that as the water is pushed through each subsequent filter, it becomes more and more aligned. And by the time the water comes out of the nozzle, having passed through several filters, all of the particles of water are traveling together on a parallel course. This is the system that produces those smooth, non-turbulent, beautiful streams of water. I've since learned that the system that, that uh, they do that is called laminar flow. That's the technical term, laminar flow. And that's when they cause all the particles and layers of a fluid to travel in a parallel course without colliding into one another and crossing in front of one another. Laminar flow, as it turns out, has all kinds of really good uses in scientific fields and in medical fields. And as we'll see today, it also has something to do with our life in Christ. You see, before we had a life in Christ, we were like that chaotic fountain, spraying and going everywhere and really just not having any direction in our lives. And today we're going to look at the first few verses of Ephesians, but before we do that, since this is a series uh, of Ephesians, it might do well to, to take a look at the book overall. And let's start with the city of Ephesus. When Paul wrote that letter back in the first century, the city of Ephesus was a very important metropolitan city in the Roman Empire. With more than a quarter of a million people, it was probably the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire. It was on the west coast of Asia Minor, we would call it today Turkey, and it was right on the edge of the Aegean Sea. And that put it at crossroads for travel and for commerce. From there you could travel to Rome, to Greece, to Northern Europe, to Eastern Europe, to the Far East, to the Near East, and even to Africa. So you get the idea that it was a pretty bustling city. And a short distance from the city of Ephesus was that Temple of Artemis. And that was a, a wonder of the world and one of those famous and must-see destinations for the people in Ephesus and for anybody who visited Ephesus. If you put it all together, the city of Ephesus itself was a place with a thriving commerce, a diverse population, a vibrant culture. And with all of that, the vibrant culture could also sometimes turn chaotic and turbulent as well. And if you think about it, that makes it a lot like our little corner of the world, doesn't it? We too have commerce and a diverse culture and a vibrant culture, but it often turns chaotic and turbulent. So with that in mind, I want to pause here for just a, just a minute and remind all of us of an important truth, that in Christ Jesus we are, of course, redeemed, but we are also assured that God is going to carry us through and shepherd us through any of the turbulent things that might or might not happen in our little culture. That's an important thing to keep in mind as we go through the book of Ephesians. Now, the city of Ephesus was also an important place in Christian history, too. And in the Bible, the city is mentioned by name several different times. I think I've shared it before, but one of my favorite places where they talk about the city of Ephesus is in 1 Corinthians. And Paul there writes, What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I wrestle with beasts in Ephesus? 
Now, we don't think that Paul wrestled with beasts himself, and he wasn't inviting or encouraging anybody to do that, but you get the idea that in this city called Ephesus, you could, if you wanted, have any number of interesting, exhilarating, and even dangerous adventures and experiences. Some of them were probably godly, and some of them were probably not. Sounds a lot like our little corner of the world, doesn't it? All kinds of adventures await us, some of them godly, some of them not. And then in Acts chapter 18, we read that Paul stopped in the city of Ephesus once on his way. He was traveling to Jerusalem. He was just there for a few days, and while there, of course, he preached the gospel primarily to to Jewish people, and they asked him to stay for a little bit longer, and he said, well, I have to travel to Jerusalem to keep my plans, but if the Lord wills, I will be back, he said. And then in Acts chapter 19, we see that the Lord indeed will it, and Paul was able to return to Ephesus. And this time he stayed for somewhere between two and three years, and it was the longest he stayed in any one single place in all of his missionary life. This time, he relentlessly preached the gospel again, but this time to Jews and Gentiles alike in the synagogues and in the town square, wherever people would hear him. And during that time, God did many, many great things through Paul. And because the population of Ephesus was so dynamic and changing with all of the people coming and going, scholars have estimated that the work and words of Paul touched the lives and hearts of somewhere between a million and two million people. So yes, God was doing amazing things through Paul. And of course, Paul planted a church there in Ephesus too. Arguably, this is the largest and most influential Christian church of the first century. But the presence of the church and the increasing number of Christians in the city of Ephesus began to change the the dynamic of the culture and of the economy. And the local residents who didn't become believers were not really very happy about this, and eventually it became increasingly difficult and turbulent for Paul and his friends to keep the work going. And at some point, Paul was really forced to leave Ephesus, and he was never able to return to that city. And about five years later is when the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write this letter back to his friends in the city of Ephesus. He wrote this letter near the end of his life. He was in Rome under house arrest, and he was writing a letter to his dear friends and his co-workers, people who had worked with him and labored with him in Ephesus in the good times and in the turbulent times. Now, if you take the book as a whole, the two most prominent themes that arise are themes that have to deal with unity. Of course, Paul often describes the unity that we have with Christ in faith. In fact, I suspect that most of us have this Bible passage memorized, right, where we are united with Christ through faith, and this is not of our own doing. But Paul also writes often in in this letter about the idea that the Christian church and the people in the Christian church are united with each other as well. And he touched on those two themes even in the first few sentences that we read just a little bit ago. I'm going to read some of them again, and I think you'll hear those themes. At the outset, Paul says, From Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, to God's holy and faithful people in the city of Ephesus who are united with Christ. There it is, out of the box. He wants to talk talk to them about being united with Christ. But he goes on. Good will and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ are yours. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Christ, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing that heaven has to offer. So I don't know if you heard it or not, but he's writing to a group of Christians, and sometimes he speaks to them, addressing them as you. But often, Paul uses the words us, and our, and we. So as we continue our study of Ephesians, it's important to note that Paul doesn't simply talk to Christians about their faith. Indeed, he does that. And of course, he encourages us to hold fast to the unity that we have with Christ and with each other. But he also reminded them that even though he was far away from them, he was a part of that same unity. He shared in it. Miles and years separated Paul from all of his friends, but he reminds them that they are still united with Christ and with each other and with him as well. 
Now surely they had this unity that came from the memories and the work that they did together as they toiled and worked in Ephesus, but Paul doesn't talk too much about that kind of unity. There is a, a certain unity that comes when you work together on some project, but Paul talks about a unity that runs even deeper than that. He talks about the unity that comes from all of the spiritual blessings that heaven lavishes upon us. So their shared memories that they had were very real, but they were a thing of the past, and they would not be recreated. But the unity, the unity that comes from the spiritual blessings, that's what Paul wanted to talk to them about and to us as well. In order to think more carefully about this kind of unity, I hope you'll bear with me while I indulge in another personal story. I'll I'll try to keep it short. Some of you probably know that when I went to college, I went to Arizona State University. And while I was there, I was a member of the marching band. And that means I'm a band geek. And that means I have tons of stories about my days in band. Some of them start with one day in band camp. And my wife will attest to that, that I have ongoing stories about band. And in my garage, I still have at least one box filled with shirts and shoes and other band swag. But for four years, I was a member of the marching band, and every fall, we would go out to practice. And practice at Arizona State, which is in Phoenix, takes place from 4 o'clock until 5.30 in the afternoon. So the days were often filled with more than 100 degree temperatures. But I did it because I loved it and it was fun. And I still belong to a group on Facebook of marching band alumni. This group now consists of more than a thousand members at least. And our band director at the, at the time that I was there was a man named Robert Fleming. We didn't call him Professor Fleming, we could have, that was his title. We didn't call him Dr. Fleming, we could have, he had his doctorate. We called him Coach because that's what he was, a, a beloved and wonderful coach. And sadly, last month, Coach died. And in the weeks since his death, that Facebook group that I'm a member of has simply lit up. Of course, there have been memories of football games and other events and being a part of the marching band. But there are also all these tributes that people wrote to Coach Fleming himself. Now, I know a handful of the people who are posting on Facebook, but most of them I don't know because I was in band at a different time than they were. But I'm beginning to realize that no matter what years we were in the marching band, we all had the very same experience with our beloved coach. Of course, everything coach did for us was laser focused on making sure that we could be one of the best, arguably the best marching band in the country. Now I know I'm in Southern California territory, but we have a trophy back at Arizona State that's given to the best marching band in the country. So we're not, we're not just bragging about that, it's we have some, something to back it up. And Coach Fleming aligned us and put us on a parallel course, literally, so that we could be that good, that best marching band. It was a literal kind of alignment because, well, we were supposed to march in formation and not cross into one another and collide with one another, and we were supposed to play in harmony while we did it all, too. But as I read the tributes, another aspect of Coach's influence became evident. It became evident from the day he started at Arizona State until the day he retired, which was a 26-year career, he had a genuine respect and love for every person who stepped into the practice field in the marching band. It didn't matter if you were a a music major or not. He valued you and he respected you. It didn't matter if you were a super talented musician or not. I can attest to that personally. I was not only not a certain super talented musician, I wasn't even a mediocre talented musician, but he knew me, he respected me, and he valued me. It's amazing. It didn't matter if you were a freshman or a fifth-year senior. In fact, freshmen were not to be called freshmen or newbies or rookies or treated like that. Freshmen were called blue chippers because that's what they were, valuable, important people in the band and its future. And they were to be treated that way. So Coach was also aligning us in a figurative sort of sense, too. He fostered a unity in the marching band that had a profound impact on thousands of people. Now, you might think I'm exaggerating, and I do respect the man an awful lot, but it seems that everybody who joined the band had that same experience with Coach. 
within the first two or three encounters of him, within the first two or three minutes of meeting him, we all came to understand that he respected us and cared about us as a member of the band and as human beings. Looking back on all of this, this was a a laminar effect for us. Coach put filters in place, literally and figuratively, aligning us and uniting us. I could go on, but I'll stop for now and see if I can bring all of this together. Here's the big point. If Coach Fleming could do this with a marching band over 26 years, how much more can our eternal God do for us in his death and his resurrection? uniting us, putting us on parallel courses, giving us a laminar life. So in the book of Ephesians, we're going to see that God has indeed blessed us with every spiritual blessing, and those spiritual blessings are essentially filters for all of his people at Ephesus and for all of us as well, aligning us and putting us on a, on a parallel course. So in the book of Ephesians, we will find God's words of instructions, right? God's words telling us what to do and how to live. And those words, my friend, are a spiritual blessing because they are a filter for us. They align us with his will for our lives, and his will for our lives is good. He is a good God, and he has good intentions for us. So even his instructions are a filter. They are a spiritual blessing. And his instructions also remind us of something that might not seem like a spiritual blessing at first. You see, before we came to faith, we were in a life of turbulence and chaos, and we were stuck in this this meaningless life and turbulence of chaos. And the words of instruction remind us of that. It was a turbulence of our own making, and we couldn't get out. But as much as those might seem like bad news kinds of words, they are a spiritual blessing. They are a filter that align us with humility. And they are a filter that also align us with faith and give us faith in the salvation that Jesus Christ accomplished for us. And we'll also, in the book of Ephesians, read those words of faith and salvation. That's That's the epitome of the gospel. That's the best spiritual blessing, I suppose, that we have. That is a filter for us. It aligns us and unifies us with Christ. And it is a filter that he uses to take all of the sin out of our lives, making us holy. And also, in the book of Ephesians, we're going to read words that show us how God now equips us to take all of those spiritual blessings we've had and use them and share them with each other, aligning us and uniting us with each other as well as with himself. So as I wrap this up today, I, I want to share just some few words about, of gratitude and a few words of encouragement. In my time here over the last four or five years, I've experienced even more of that respect from each and every one of you, whether it's the teachers on the staff, the, the leaders here, the members, and everyone here has made me feel valuable and as a, a, a respected brother in Christ. The little things. The the letters that you take time to send me here and there, the the comments and the words that you share with me out in the the courtyard, the relationships that we've built, it's all been something that I'm very grateful for, and it's a part of that unity and part of those stories that I'll carry forever. So today I simply want to encourage you to be mindful of and grateful for those spiritual blessings that Paul talks about. All the spiritual blessings of heaven have been given to you. And they are filters that align you with him and with each other. It's a laminar effect. And remember this, like Coach, in fact, infinitely more than Coach Fleming, Jesus Christ also welcomes and honors and values every person who walks around in our little corner of the world. It doesn't matter where they came from. It doesn't matter what color their skin is. It doesn't matter what color they're going to vote for, whether it's red or blue or purple or green or whatever. It doesn't matter what grades they received in school. It doesn't matter what people say about them on social media. Anyone and everyone who sets foot in our little corner of the world is valued by God, is a loved human being. 
and anyone and everyone who sets foot in our little corner of the world is a person who God desires to unite with himself and with each of us. That's the lamb in our life. Amen.